Ladies and gentlemen, the Shrek Gamer Telecom video, we're going to be discussing GPUs, as the subject matter seems to be at this point. I guess there's a hell of a lot of news, considering, of course, we're waiting for the next generation of cards. So, this particular video is going to be focusing on AMD's upcoming range of GPUs, specifically the naming conventions and other pieces of news related to that. And then we're going to discuss Samsung, more specifically regarding their production of high bandwidth memory too, because now they're starting to mass produce the chips. But we're going to continue first with AMD, because obviously it's first in the naming convention, so I tend to try to keep to alphabet, uh, just, you know, for no favoritism. Now... Internally, of course, we've heard various names regarding the next generation of AMD's GPUs, which is fair enough. Generally speaking, for projects, you find the PR name and then you find the internal, I guess you could say, project name. Internally, however, AMD have been referring to Greenland, which, just to get everyone onto the same page, Greenland is the equivalent of nowadays Fury X. It's the highest end card. It would be the one that has the most amount of shaders, the most amount of memory, the highest memory bandwidth, obviously the most expensive, and as well, finally, the one that offers the highest amount of performance, at least at the time of its launch for consumers, well, regular customers anyway. Now, as we all know, AMD have put together Radeon Technologies Group, which is obviously solely responsible for the distribution, creation, design, and sale of the graphics cards. Raja Kodori, who is the Senior Vice President as well as the Chief Architect, has recently been speaking with VentureBeat, and he said, and I quote, Does the Polaris brand, this is an answer to this question, does Polaris brand supplant the Radeon brand? And uh, he responds, it's an architecture code name. It'd still be the Radeon something something on the box, but we didn't have a consistent architecture name like our competitors do. It was hard because for people, including yourselves and some of the press and enthusiasts, this family of chips has to architecture and a familiar class of features, so you can group them together easily. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit jumbled up. We know AMD have officially named two GPUs. They've shown them off in press. You can't find photos of them because, as I mentioned in a video a day or two ago, essentially the press were prohibited to take images of the particular GPUs, which is a shame, but it is what it is. But anyway, the two GPUs were Polaris 11 and Polaris 10. Now, one of them was pretty small. It was about the same size as Cape Verde, which is about 123 mm squared in size, obviously pretty minuscule. That one's, as I've mentioned previously, is aiming to deliver console-like performance. So let's say for the sake of this video, PlayStation 4 level of performance, but with ultra-thin light books and notebooks, that type of stuff. So let's say essentially something you might carry with you on like a train or maybe on a plane that type of thing portable fairly decent in performance but obviously still has a fairly small power envelope for obvious reasons the other one however is the big boy it's the 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 larger of the two but while it has been described and i quote by journalists as the successor to the Radeon R9 Fury X, which is, a, by the way, a bloody unwieldy name, which is probably one of the reasons they're changing the naming conventions, but we'll get back to in just a moment. It's unknown how Vega 10 actually links into all of this. So, Greenland has been known as Vega 10 internally for some time now, but we as customers, we as journalists, we as gamers are not still quite sure how the Radeon hierarchy is really going to come together. For example, and this is a pure example, is there going to be the equivalent of Polaris 11, Polaris 10, Polaris 9, Polaris 8, or maybe it could be Polaris 11 for the ultra high end, Polaris 10 for the medium end, Polaris 9, Polaris... We just don't know. Well, maybe it could even be Polaris 10 for the 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 netbooks, the low power, Polaris 11 for the ultra high end ones, Polaris 12, Polaris, we just don't know, and v Vegas 10. So Vegas 10, for those of you who are into the study of the stars, the study of the galaxy, also known of course as astronomy, it's the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere, and it's 
pretty it's pretty famous in the um in the it's pretty famous in a lot of circles because it's been extensively studied um, and probably, and to be honest with you, most people have heard of Vega. Uh, it's probably probably about the second most important scar, uh, star in the sky, and it, at least in terms of fame levels, it's been fame. It's been photo uh, photographed, excuse me, and consistently studied by um, scientists for some time now. So perhaps that's the reason AMD are going with it in terms of naming conventions. I kind of like the idea of them going with this scheme the problem is I guess I would like to know more about how they're going to name it for example and this is a pure example let's say you have Vega and another star Rigel for the sake of argument what is which or let's say you have another one which is like the Milky Way and another one, which is, you know, Bob's Galaxy. How are we still going to differentiate those? So, I'm going to assume that what they're going to do is still have some numbering convention or some methodology of us being able to easily ascertain which is which. Because otherwise, as customers, we probably won't. Don't get me wrong, I think most people who are informed, and let's face it, I feel that the era of people just randomly buying stuff is not so much what it was back in the day because now there is so much more information readily available and i don't just mean from youtube and review websites i mean from everyone like most websites you buy stuff from for the sake of argument let's say you go to um overclockers uk and i'm not advertising for them i'm just simply giving an example you could go to complex you could go to amazon typically speaking they will, I guess you could say, they will feature. They will place certain products which are the most important, the most popular, the biggest releases, and they will feature those. They will plaster those over the website, and it's pretty obvious that those are the ones which they may not offer the best value for money, but they offer really great performance. So, obviously, sometimes it's a case of that GPU was released later. It doesn't necessarily equal to the fact it's got better performance or much better performance. But you don't generally get the gist. Anyway, um, now we're going to switch things over to Samsung. So, Samsung, of course, are going to be pretty critical, pretty crucial when it comes to graphics cards. While they're not obviously producing, let's say, the designs for NVIDIA's Pascal architecture... They do create the high bandwidth memory and produce that, which, of course, will be used on Pascal as well as AMD's upcoming GPUs as well. So, last year, Samsung announced it would be commencing mass production of HBM DRAM in 2016. Actually, early 2016. And for those of you who have got a calendar or maybe been checking around the internet, you probably realise that early 2016 is now. So Samsung have officially announced that they are commencing mass production of the first 4GB, and that part's important, 4GB HBM2 DRAM, which is obviously going to be aiming at uh, both high-end graphics rendering, so in other words, gamers or anyone who's creating a lot of uh, high-resolution graphical work, and also deep learning. So once again the whole science usage of computers. Now, it's going to be kind of nuts because that 4GB HPM2 DRAM has 256GB of bandwidth just for that one chip. Now, as we all know, and I won't go through the whole usage of HPM2 because we all know how it works by now, most likely. Essentially speaking, you can stack that stuff up, and that's why you can start getting insane amounts of memory bandwidth. You can go up to like one terabyte per second, which is absolutely gargantuan. And as we all know, the production of this memory is also going to start to become quite important as developers start to, well, I guess you could say, fill up the memory that we've got. Because... Let's say you have two of those packages together. 
um, on, let's say, a medium range product, let's say an APU has a couple of these chips on it, which isn't out of the realms of impossibility. Let's say you have a standard APU that's got a reasonable amount of shaders, it has a pretty decent CPU packed in there, you could conceivably have two HBM2 chips which would provide 512 gigabytes per second of bandwidth and 8 gigabytes of RAM. Now that could then be supplemented potentially with let's say DDR4 memory, maybe let's say 8 to 16 gigabytes, and then you've got a pretty decent amount of memory which potentially could then be uh, coherent, so you've got that coherent memory, and then you've got obviously other memory which could be used for like say system usage that type of thing or you could go the whole hog the full package would be 16 gigabytes of ram with one terabyte per second because you would have four of these dram packages which is absolutely crazy um eventually we're going to start seeing more and eventually we're going to start seeing up to potentially 32 gigabytes which we know some of the high-end cards will be able to feature but that won't be for some time now so all we can do is wait regarding that but it's going to be pretty cool at least in my opinion anyway hopefully you've enjoyed the video i'll see you soon take care bye for now